shatters a residential neighborhood and kills a police officer. What's left are a million scattered fragments and no apparent motive. Authorities hit the streets to solve a murder, but the roots of this insidious crime lie hundreds of miles away. Shops are bursting into flames in Southern California. But it takes investigators years to learn the arsonist's devastating pattern. Some crimes go beyond the scope of local law enforcement and into the realm of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. The felon who sets fires, builds bombs, or traffics in weapons isn't just breaking the law. He's committing a federal offense. Located just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, lies the quiet working class neighborhood of Roslindale. But on October 27th, 1991, that sense of quiet came to an end. That morning, Thomas Shea Sr. backed his car out of his driveway on his way to work. He heard a scraping noise and stopped to investigate. he found a small black box on his driveway. Though he owned an auto body repair company, Shea knew nothing about the mechanics of cars. He assumed it was part of the undercarriage. His neighbors convinced him it looked more sinister than that. They urged him to call the police. Shea told police about the suspicious object. He was now afraid it might be a bomb. Bomb investigators Jerry Hurley and Frank Foley examined the small wooden box. Each had more than 20 years experience in high risk situations. Foley were severely injured by the blast. According to ATF Special Agent Jeff Kerr, the police did what they could until help arrived. Um, both of them um, still conscious, both of them heroic as could be, concerned for each other, asking how is Frank, and uh, Frank asking how is Jerry, and the people in the neighborhood started responding, and ambulances were called, and that was the beginning of, the, uh, of quite a long investigation. Because police officers had been injured in the blast, agents from the ATF's Boston office were called in. The ATF's national response team worked with Boston police to find the culprit and the motive. Paramedics tried to stabilize the bomb technicians. Both were seriously injured. They were taken to the nearest hospital. Later that day, Jerry Hurley died of his injuries. Frank Foley was maimed for life. The bomber was now a killer. Investigators collected every speck of debris, hoping some of it might be unique enough to lead to the bomber. Most of the fragments were common electronic components. Toggle switches, soldered joints, electrical tape, batteries. They could be obtained anywhere, making them virtually useless as clues. Among the bits of shattered plastic, metal, and wood, the ATF tried to find a grain of truth. At this point, everyone was a potential suspect. 
especially Thomas Shea Sr. First of all, you have to question the validity of the initial statements. Was this thing on, on the car? Did it fall off? Did, he, did this individual who found this actually pick it up, move it, and then a day later move it back? So those are some of the questions. Then why does it detonate when this officer is, is, is standing over it? That's one of the questions. Is, is it designed for a police officer? Was it designed to get a police officer out there and to kill a police officer? Though the ATF had to consider that Shea might have been the bomber, he wasn't a man without enemies. He'd made a minor career out of petty litigation and was currently involved in a heated lawsuit with the owner of the garage where he rented workspace. The owner was added to the list of suspects. Later, another member of the Shea family appeared on the scene. Okay, Tommy, why don't you have a seat for Shea's estranged teenage son, Tommy, heard about the bombing on the news. He rushed to his father's house, but when his father's girlfriend wouldn't let him in, he went to the police station to find out what happened. He seemed genuinely concerned. After investigators filled him in, he answered some routine questions and left. The ATF would have to focus their attention on the physical evidence. All of the material collected at the scene was sent to the ATF lab. Investigators found what appeared to be the detonator. Small, white, crystalline particles coated the device. The material was determined to be unexploded dynamite. The technicians reasoned that the explosive had been taken out of its original casing and re-wrapped to make it fit inside the bomb. The wrapping also provided the next clue. Bits of colored paper clinging to tape. Forensic chemist Cynthia Wallace examined the paper. They looked like they were from a magazine. They also had pictures of looked like mussels and maybe some fruits and vegetables and a little tiny piece of writing. Looking at that, it appeared to me that that might be the graphic artist's name who had designed the, the photograph and the layout of the article. So I had our librarian give me a list of all the muscle magazine uh, publishers that she could come up with, and I started calling them up. Wallace managed to find the magazine that hired that graphic artist. With the publisher's help, she even found the issue and page number of the layout. She asked for a list of local subscribers. Unfortunately, muscle magazines like this are usually sold over the counter, and they have very few subscription sales. Though the quirky wrapping didn't lead directly to the bomber, it helped to establish his signature, the specific way he constructed the device by rewrapping the dynamite. As the evidence collection continued, another clue emerged. Several distinctive screws. They were unique to a specific brand of remote control device. The component is used in remote control toys. Rigging it to an explosive device required some knowledge of electronics. This bomber, whoever he was, had been doing his homework or had done this before. As investigators began to create a profile of their bomber, the next clue came from an unexpected source. On October 31st, three days after the bombing, Tommy Shea held a press conference. The bombing had garnered widespread media attention and much of it focused on his family. He claimed that he was the target of the bomb. He said the bomber was a man he owed $50,000. Tommy's admission was news to police. Nothing in their investigation pointed to Tommy as the target. After the conference, they asked him to come to the station to tell them more. Agents checked into Tommy's story. They found no evidence that could link the man Tommy accused to the bombing. They also did a background check on Tommy Shea Jr. and discovered he was wanted in another town for receiving stolen property. Police arrested him on the spot. 
and took an inventory of everything he had in his possession. It included a little address book. Eventually, Tommy was released on his own recognizance. By now, police had interviewed 200 people about the bombing and had made very little progress. Investigators turned their attention to the evidence collected from the bomb site. The thousands of tiny pieces recovered from the scene had given the ATF national response team enough to reconstruct the device. They passed its description to various police departments. Before long, Special Agent Kerr got his next lead. One very astute uh, detective remembers a 1986 incident where there was an explosive incident, and he provides that police report and that information to um, the agents that were down there. They bring it back. There's some similarities to this device, m minor similarities, but similarities nevertheless. In that incident, five years earlier, a truck had been damaged by a remote control bomb resembling the one that detonated at Shea's house. The main suspect in the case eventually cooperated with authorities and avoided a prison sentence. His name was Alfred Trinkler. Somebody said, wouldn't it be weird if that name was in Tommy's book? And went back to the back of it, to the T's, and sure enough, there it was. Yeah, come on in, fellas. Uh, what can I do for you today? On November 6th, a week after the bombing, investigators paid a visit to Trinkler at his home, a short distance from Boston. He had his own small electronics and communications equipment company. He was very cooperative, even sketching for the police the bomb he built in 1986. He denied knowing Tommy Shea and agreed to take a polygraph. Later, he changed his mind about taking the test. Alfred Trinkler certainly seemed like the front runner on the list of suspects. The problem was that the police had no physical evidence to tie him to the scene. To build their case, or to remove Trinkler from suspicion, the ATF tried a different tack. Investigators of the bombing in Boston knew that the device that killed Officer Hurley resembled the handiwork of Alfred Trinkler. But they didn't know if the fatal bomb was a common design or a unique one. Good morning, gentlemen. To find out, they sent the information gathered from the scene to intelligence research specialist Steve Scheid in Washington, D.C. Scheid would be able to plug the information he knew about the device into a national database of bombing incidents. We were looking for remote control bombs. We were looking for uh, bombs that had magnets attached to them, bombs that had electrical detonators. We were looking for particular types of switches and batteries. The ATF database sifted through 14,000 bombings and came up with seven hits. And of those seven, five were eliminated because of a clear motive or because they'd been solved. That left only two, Trinkler's 1986 bomb and the bomb found in Thomas Shea's driveway. No matter what equation they used, the answer was always Alfred Trinkler. Agents believe that Trinkler and Tommy Shea Jr. worked together on the bomb but investigators had little physical evidence to tie the two men together. Did you check? No, thanks. All right, take Thank care. you. Agents visited electronic stores. In one, a clerk identified Tommy from a photograph. He also found a receipt for merchandise purchased on October 18th, just 10 days before the explosion. It showed electronic components purchased by someone named Ashy, Shea with the letters rearranged. The store was across the street from a building where Trinkler had been installing a microwave tower. You all right on that beer, man? Yeah. Agents still hadn't clearly identified why Trinkler and Shea would want to kill Tommy's father. So what you need for this? Shea's friction with his father wasn't a convincing enough motive. Then, agents turned up a better one. Thomas Shea Sr.'s lawsuit against the garage owners. 
If Shea won his suit, he stood to gain $100,000. Tommy Shea had made some inquiries to the attorney handling the case for his father that what happens if my father dies? Where does, does the lawsuit carry on? And he was informed he had a lawsuit carries on to his heirs, which would be his four children. Days before the bombing, Tommy had also told a friend that he was going to get a large sum of money. A warrant was issued for Tommy Shea and Alfred Trinkler. Though the case against Shea was mostly circumstantial, investigators felt it would hold. Tommy Shea must have thought so too. Shea confessed to buying the bomb components and placing the device under his father's car. He said that Trinkler told him what to buy. Trinkler built the bomb. Alfred Trinkler denied any involvement, even though the evidence was stacked against him. Tommy Shea pled guilty to conspiracy to cause the death of a public servant and abetting the illegal use of explosives. He was sentenced to 12 years. Alfred Trinkler's resolve never weakened. He never talked, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Trinkler and Shea formed a conspiracy of two, but often a seemingly simple crime can expose a vast network of corruption. In this case, some of the names have been changed. December 9, 1996. Washington, D.C. paramedics responded to the scene of a shooting in the southeast area of the city. They found a young man unconscious, apparently the victim of gang-related violence. His name was Laura Henderson. On the way to the hospital, Henderson's condition suddenly worsened. The ambulance pulled over. Paramedics worked to stabilize him enough to get to the hospital. An EMT supervisor pulled up and offered to help. The paramedics accepted gratefully. As she worked, a man approached her and demanded to see his cousin. She asked him to step away from the ambulance. He pulled a gun and opened fire. One paramedic struggled with the gunman and You're wrestled right. the weapon from him. The other paramedic took a shot to the foot. Henderson was killed instantly. Police processed the scene. The paramedics couldn't identify the assassin. The attack had happened too fast. But he had been injured in the scuffle, and his blood was found on the paramedic's shirt. The garment was kept as potential evidence. The handgun retrieved at the scene, which had delivered the fatal shots, was a 40 caliber Beretta semi-automatic. But Henderson was initially wounded by 9 millimeter slugs. Police knew that two guns were used in this crime but they didn't know if one or two shooters were involved. Interviews with potential witnesses and people from the neighborhood yielded the tip that cracked the case. A witness told police that only one shooter was involved. His name was Robert Byrd. A few days into the investigation, an informant, feeling it was now safe to come forward, told police that on the night of the shooting, she doing? heard Robert Byrd ask a friend to hide a gun in his stepmother's home. How long have you known Mr. Byrd? Tell me what happened. What? Police followed up the tip with a search warrant. They talked with Byrd's friend, who denied being involved. Then, they uncovered a 9mm Ruger semi-automatic handgun. You sure there are no firearms in this house? Found what we're looking for. The weapon was sent to the police lab.
After test firing the weapon, a ballistics comparison determined that this was the gun used to initially wound Laura Henderson. Robert Byrd was arrested. A warrant was issued for a sample of his blood. DNA testing compared it with the blood found on the shirt. It matched. The odds that the shooter was someone other than Byrd were one in 1.5 billion. Byrd was sentenced to 58 years to life for one count of first degree murder and five counts of assault. That's where the case might have ended except that one of the guns used to convict Byrd, the 9mm Ruger, was part of a much bigger story. Washington, D.C. has one of the country's highest rates of handgun violence. Despite strict laws prohibiting handguns, they find their way onto the streets, and most often into the hands of gang members. Over the past five years, nearly 2,000 people were murdered in the District of Columbia alone. It's the job of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to stop the flow of these illegal weapons by cutting them off at their source. But once the weapons are already on the street, they could turn up anywhere. The ATF dedicates its vast resources to tracing handguns used to commit crimes, but they have to find them before they can trace them. Records maintained by licensed gun dealers are the key to tracing guns used in crimes. According to the ATF's Washington Field Division Special Agent in Charge, Patrick Hines, the records can pinpoint exactly how a gun falls into the wrong hands. Every gun has a lineage, a pedigree, where it was manufactured, what wholesaler it went to, what retailer, who was the first purchaser of that firearm, and how it weaved its way through the manufacturer to the last person that had it involved in a crime. Guns are traced by their serial numbers, but many guns retrieved from crimes have had their numbers filed off. Before they can begin a routine trace, ATF forensic scientists have to restore the gun's serial number. That's the job of firearms and tool mark examiner Elizabeth Gillis at the ATF National Lab in Rockville, Maryland. At the lab, they often must raise numbers from 60 or 70 guns at a time. Even if the number appears completely gone, Gillis can usually retrieve it. The stamping process actually changes the molecular structure of the metal, giving it a sort of memory. It just takes a little prodding to restore it. After smoothing and cleaning the surface where the number was filed off, it's treated with a chemical reagent. Because stamping the serial number weakens the metal on the surface of the gun, the reagent attacks the weakened metal around the serial number at a different rate than the metal on the rest of the gun. This reaction, when viewed under a bright light, creates a contrast, making the serial number visible. Once the serial number has been stamped into a gun, it is nearly impossible to obliterate it. It's almost like indented writing, like if you wrote on a pad of paper and you tore off that first sheet that you had written on, the sheet below, typically you can see an impression of what you wrote on that first page. With a gun's serial number in hand, ATF investigators can begin to trace it. They first contact its manufacturer. The manufacturer of the gun that killed Laura Henderson reported that it had been purchased by Len Jones, a licensed gun dealer from Missouri. Special Agent Michael Mund found it peculiar that a gun sold in Missouri made its way to the streets of Washington, D.C. Missouri is not one of the states that we know of being the source state of firearms trafficked in the District of Columbia. About half of the firearms that are recovered in the District of Columbia come from the states of Maryland and Virginia, uh, with the rest of the firearms coming from the southern states. As a licensed dealer, Jones was required by law to record every gun he purchased and to whom and when he sold it. The ATF found no record of who purchased the gun that killed Laura Henderson. 
But Jones may have been guilty of more than just bad record keeping. Hoping to find the source of the gun that killed Laura Henderson, the ATF paid a visit to Len Jones. His records indicated that he'd bought 106 handguns. But a check of gun manufacturers determined that between January 1994 and February 96, he had bought more than 1,500 guns. This was a blatant violation of federal gun dealing laws. Investigators wondered how many of these weapons were on the streets of Washington, D.C. It wasn't long before they began to find out. While they were investigating Jones, four more crime guns were traced back to him. Most were in the hands of juvenile offenders and were confiscated shortly after he'd sold them. When ATF agents confronted Jones, he came clean. He told investigators that between July 1994 and March 1996, he had sold over a thousand handguns to a pair of dealers from Tennessee. ATF agents located the dealers, who said they sold the firearms they had bought from Jones at gun shows outside of their home state of Tennessee. The two had run roughshod over firearms laws. Not only is it illegal to sell handguns across state lines, the two didn't even have a license to sell weapons in the first place. They faced up to 10 years in prison. But the two were just one link in the chain of criminals that was delivering guns into the hands of juveniles and other offenders in Washington, D.C. The ATF was willing to work a deal if the dealers would share the names of some of their customers. They told investigators that one of their best customers was a man named Calvin, also from Tennessee. Over the years, they had sold Calvin more than 200 guns. They said that Calvin had bought semi-automatic pistols, mostly 9mm and 38 Rugers and Lorsons. But the two men didn't know where Calvin lived, or even if that was his real name. They told the agents he was an African-American man who drove a station wagon. When they wanted to find him, they called a pager number, which they turned over to the ATF. Agents learned that the pager number belonged to a man named Calvin Brown. They got his address in Nashville, Tennessee. In November 1996, agents began their stakeout. After a number of hours, we observed the vehicle to pull up to the uh, location. Uh, a black male was driving the vehicle, and he fit the description that was given to us. Investigators ran the station wagon's license plate and found out that Calvin Brown's real name was Salon Carroll. He worked as a counselor at a youth center in Nashville. We felt we were, we were moving along in the investigation and that we needed to uh, bring it to an end so that uh, Carroll could not traffic any more firearms uh, to the District of Columbia. Investigators devised a sting to catch Carroll, hopefully without gunfire. In December 1996, an ATF informant contacted him to sell some illegal weapons. Carroll specified that he was interested only in guns without serial numbers. On January 15, 1997, they met in a motel parking lot. Carroll purchased 19 pistols and an automatic Mac-10 machine gun for $3,000 with an additional $1,550 to be paid later. When Carroll got out of the car to retrieve the guns, ATF agents moved in. Faced with up to 20 years in federal prison, Carroll admitted to selling over 200 weapons to known gang members in Washington, D.C. Well, what do you think these kids are doing with those 20 things, have huh? been taken from juvenile offenders. Now, Crimes no. committed with these guns include burglary, armed assault, and murder. 
one of those weapons was sold by Salam Carroll to a gang member in Washington, D.C. The gang member, in turn, sold it to Robert Byrd. Bird used it to murder Laura Henderson. To date, 109 weapons traced to Carroll have been recovered as the result of joint ATF Washington, D.C. police investigations. Most of the guns illegally purchased by Carroll are still in criminal hands. The ATF continues to monitor the case. This is only scratching the surface of crime that can develop from this legacy of death and of illegal firearms trafficking. We don't know where these other firearms are going to show up. We only hope that other people do not get hurt or murdered by them. For some, that hope is already in vain. Len Jones was sentenced to 16 months for illegal sale of firearms. The dealers in Tennessee avoided jail time by cooperating with the ATF. And Salon Carroll was sentenced to five years in prison and three years of supervised release. At his sentencing, the judge referred to him as the dealer of death. By trafficking illegal weapons hundreds of miles from his home, Salon Carroll distanced himself from his crimes. Other criminals like to work from the inside. On January 14, 1987, firefighters in Fresno, California, were called to a large fire in a fabric store. suspicious blazers. Over the next four days, seven fires were set or attempted in and around Fresno, Tulare, and Bakersfield. All started in shops during business hours. Investigators could not find any evidence of an accelerant, yet all the fires spread quickly. People evacuated from the stores told firefighters the blaze seemed to come out of nowhere. After ruling out other causes, investigators suspected arson in every case. The seven fires caused over $700,000 in damage. The flames left behind few clues. Arsonists count on fire to destroy all evidence that might lead back to them. Processing fire evidence is a specialized task, one that small-town forensic labs don't usually handle. The samples collected from the fires were sent to the ATF lab near San Francisco. Darryl, can you take fingerprints of these items? Among the rubble, the only promising clue was a charred cigarette butt, some burned matches, and a piece of yellow paper secured by a melted rubber band recovered from a fire in Bakersfield. Investigators surmised that these innocent looking items might have been part of a simple delay device used to set the fire. Investigators were lucky to have found it. ATF senior technician Daryl Classy tried to raise fingerprints from the blackened remains of the incendiary device. It was a challenge in the fact that the paper was charred, the matches were partially burnt, and the cigarette butt had already been burnt. So there was very little clear, clean space left to find identifiable latent prints on. To perform the analysis, Classy soaked a sample of the burned material in a chemical called ninhydrin. Shake it up so we thoroughly... The solution reacts with the amino acids present in perspiration residue in a fingerprint. The evidence is bathed in an anhydrin solution, and if a fingerprint is present, the chemical turns it purple. Tests on the matches and cigarette yielded nothing. Classy was able to raise a single fingerprint from the yellow paper. Or the clean surface. Authorities in Bakersfield compared it to the prints of the firefighters who recovered the device, 
to be certain that they hadn't accidentally left the print. It didn't match any of them. The next step was to submit the print to California's automated fingerprint system, which contained the prints of known criminals. Maybe the Bakersfield investigators were dealing with an arsonist with a police record. But their arsonist had no matches, and that meant authorities had no suspects. Until the arsonist struck again and left more clues behind, investigators could do nothing. The case and the clues were filed away and all but forgotten. On March 27, 1991, four years after the first fires in Southern California, firefighters in Los Angeles County called the three burning stores in less than three hours. Though the blazes were within two miles of each other, they occurred in separate fire districts. One of the fires caused a million dollars worth of damage. In another of the fires, investigators again found the remains of the same type of delay device made from a cigarette and yellow paper. The suspicious pattern of fires might have gone unnoticed, if not for the L.A. County Sheriff's Office, which had jurisdiction over the whole area. The sheriff suspected a serial arsonist and notified the ATF. Agents from the ATF went over the records of the various fire departments that had been investigating the suspicious fires. They looked for other fires that fit the same pattern. They found more than they bargained for. Over the past four months, five fires were set in stores in and around Los Angeles. All fit the same pattern. All started during business hours. No accelerant was found. All were close to each other and to the freeway. On March 31st, 1991, four days after the Los Angeles fires, the ATF convened a task force to find other fires in Southern California that fit the pattern. ATF Special Agent Michael Matassa helped to coordinate the effort across jurisdictions as the search for the arsonist began. Well, at that point, we start interviewing witnesses, employees at these stores, uh, customers at the stores, trying to find out if uh, anything suspicious is is known. We start uh, uh, conferring with other investigators to see if they've had similar fires in their jurisdiction. Investigators in the lab continued to pour over the evidence collected from the fires. Much of the important pieces had been consumed by the blazes. What was left did not yield many useful clues. As part of the outreach effort, an ATF agent was dispatched to the monthly meeting of FIRST, the Fire Investigators Regional Strike Team. He shared the information the task force had gathered and asked the first members if they had anything to add. One of them had much to say. An investigator from the Bakersfield, Fresno area happened to be in town and was attending the conference. He pulled our investigator aside and uh, turned us on to the possibility of similar fires occurring in the uh, San Joaquin Valley in 1987. He had been in charge of the 1987 investigation when the ATF forensic lab raised the fingerprint from the yellow paper recovered from one of the Bakersfield fires. The investigator looked back at his records. As he compared the fires, he realized that all the suspicious ones had been set around the time of the California arson investigators' conferences. More than that, he realized that the fires had followed routes from the conferences heading south toward Los Angeles. The implications were chilling. The ATF now had to consider the possibility that the man they were looking for was a fire investigator turned serial arsonist. As the task force delved deeper into the fires in Southern California, they discovered a series of five fires set in Atascadero, San Luis Obispo, and Salinas. 
They all fit the pattern of the previous fires, and all were set on the same day after an arson investigator conference. As the ATF gathered files from various districts in Southern California, the pattern grew clearer. They discovered that a total of five delay-type devices had been recovered from these fires. Each was constructed from cigarettes, matches, and yellow paper. Now that they established a physical link among the fires, ATF agents retrieved the 87 fingerprint from their Fresno office. They submitted it to the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department automated fingerprint system, which accesses state employees as well as criminals. This time, the computer came up with a match, but it was no cause for celebration. Double checking only confirmed the grim conclusion. The print belonged to arson investigator John Orr. One of California's most respected fire professionals was now the prime suspect in the 1987, 1989, and 1991 fires. A 17-year veteran in the Glendale Fire Department, Orr had earned a statewide reputation as the Sherlock Holmes of fire investigation. He had trained thousands of top fire investigators. That Orr could be responsible for setting dozens of fires over a four-year period was difficult to believe. Occasionally you may find, as in any other uh, profession, somebody who's gone bad in the field, but to have someone of his uh, reputation and such widespread over such a long period of time, I mean, we're, we're incredulous over it. They looked for some other explanation. Investigators who had worked with Orr thought that perhaps he had just forgotten to wear gloves when handling evidence. When he was deep in an investigation, he got his hands on everything related to the case. But Orr hadn't worked the 1987 fires. There was no record of him even looking at the evidence. It seemed the only way John Orr's fingerprint could have gotten on the incendiary device was if he had placed it himself. Investigators had to consider him the main suspect. To prove John Orr's innocence or to establish his guilt required a deeper investigation. All they really had was a single fingerprint on only one device. Well, we kept the investigation very covert because uh, we wanted to make sure that fingerprint wasn't accidentally on the device. Uh, we only had him on the one fire, so now it was important for us to keep it uh, uh, quiet while we developed an investigation to tie him into all of these other fires that uh, we were sure the same arsonist had committed. Investigators checked Orr's log sheets at the Glendale Fire Department to see where he was when the fires were set. The log sheets could give Orr an alibi. If he were logged in at the station, he couldn't have set the fires. But in every instance, they reported him out of the office at an undetermined location. When they followed him, they observed him buying cigarettes. John Orr didn't smoke. Despite this incriminating evidence, building their case wouldn't be easy. Or knew their business as well as they did. Well, we knew when it came time to interview him that he had done interviews, so he would know what to expect in the interview. And really, we had to put as, together as much circumstantial evidence as we possibly could to prove that nobody but him could have done the fires, and that was the tactic we took. Armed with a photo of their suspect, investigators returned to the scenes of the 1987, 1989, and 1991 fires. They hoped to speak to anyone who might remember seeing Orr. They found several eyewitnesses. A number of employees were able to pick him out as a customer who had been in the store uh, prior to the fire. In one store, we had an employee say that uh, she saw him carrying uh, some paper in his hand. The yellow paper was part of the device, and she pointed out to us that the color of the paper he was carrying was yellow. Sure, I'm just looking for some fabric Witnesses put Orr at the scene of two of the fires. In both cases, 
He was spotted in the stores shortly before they burned. Then, the ATF received the forensic report on the devices recovered from the earlier fires. The ATF lab had identified a signature. That is, the devices were all built the same way, using the same materials. The ATF surmised the arsonist didn't need an accelerant because he was placing these devices in flammable items within the stores. The device was designed to start the fire slowly, letting it smolder until the extreme heat erupted into flame. That allowed the arsonist to leave the scene long before the building was engulfed. The construction of the device was simple, but its design pointed to an arsonist with a keen knowledge of fire. The forensic analysis concluded that the devices were the work of a single individual, an individual responsible for more than $18 million worth of damage. The ATF database of arsonists could not match these devices as the signature of any other known arsonist. The report cleared away any remaining doubts investigators might have had about Orr's involvement. Then, Orr himself provided an extraordinary piece of evidence. I got a phone call from uh, John Orr's supervisor, and he said that uh, he had seen a letter that the secretary was typing talking about a book that John Orr was trying to get published. In that uh, letter, he describes the suspect being a firefighter who's been setting fires for the last 10 years in Southern California and had not been apprehended. One suspect in this well, you know, but when you or hope to get the book published and to sell the rights for a television movie of the week. ATF agents acquired the manuscript from an author and former firefighter whom Orr had solicited for advice on his novel. For ATF agents who dedicate their lives to investigating deadly fires and bombings, Orr's book wasn't a pleasant read. Well, frankly, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I mean, I, I originally thought that maybe it would give us a little insight into John, but never that in my wildest imagination I think that the exact fires we were investigating were going to be chronicled uh, in, this, in the manuscript. ATF agents arrested John Orr on December 4th, 1991. Officers searching his truck found yellow ruled paper, matches, rubber bands, and cigarettes. The same brand used in the devices. In his house, they found videotapes of arson fires still under investigation. They had been shot at close range. The evidence was conclusive, leaving investigators with just one unanswered question. When we uh, interviewed him, we were uh, concerned with why he did it. I mean, we were convinced that he had done it, and we had good evidence that he did it. We were trying to get him to explain why, which he never did. In 1992, John Orr was convicted of setting three fires and sentenced to 30 years in prison. In September 1998, Orr was convicted of murder when investigators linked him to a 1984 fire that claimed the lives of two store employees, an elderly woman and her two-year-old grandson. The jury deadlocked eight to four in favor of the death penalty. Orr received life plus 20 years. No crime is committed in a vacuum. When an offense involves weapons, explosives, or incendiary devices, Solving it depends on finding a pattern. It's the ATF's job to see the big picture and pin down the culprit.